Good afternoon. I want to invite our guest, Tom Friedman, in. Hi, Tom. Hey, Ron. Great to be with you. Great. My name is Ron Leibowitz, and I'm president of Brandeis University. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's event, Thinking Ahead to the Presidential Election with New York Times columnist and Brandeis alumnus, Tom Friedman. With election day only five days away, we won't have to think too far ahead throughout our conversation. But for the next hour, I'm eager to engage Tom about what we should expect next Tuesday, what's at stake, and what lessons we might glean from this pivotal election. Tom Friedman needs little in the way of an introduction, so I'll take just a moment to provide the headlines of his career. Tom graduated from Brandeis in 1975, and then went on to earn an MPhil in Modern Middle East Studies from St. Anthony's College at Oxford University. Following graduate school, Tom started a journalism career as a reporter in Beirut, Lebanon, the United Press International, and then went on to work for the New York Times where he has served in various roles since 1981. Tom is the author of seven books, including From Beirut to Jerusalem and The World is Flat, and is the recipient of three Pulitzer Prizes two for international reporting from the Middle East, and a third for his columns written about the September 11, 2001 attacks on the World Trade Center and Pentagon. And finally, Tom is a dedicated Brandeis alumnus. He was elected to Brandeis's Board of Trustees in 1994 and served as a member until 2014. The university bestowed upon him an honorary doctor of humane letters in 1988. And before we get started, I want to encourage you to submit questions by using the Q&A button on the bottom of your Zoom screen. So let's begin. Tom, welcome again. Thank you so much for being here. Ron, it's great to be with you and great to be with the Brandeis family and community. And I uh, can't think of a nicer way to spend uh, my Thursday afternoon. Well, we thank you. In a September interview, you talked about your concern for the state of our country including fears about the potential of a second civil war if we continue on our current trajectory. We're five days away from the election. What are your thoughts about the future now? Really good question, Ron. Next question, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I uh, unfortunately, Ron, I uh, have those fears. You know, everyone is colored by their experience and um, uh, their life experience. And my life experience was growing up in Minnesota, um, uh, growing up in an amazing community that worked. I did a big webinar this morning in Minnesota for communities there introduced by my friend, Al Franken. Um, and, uh, and then I went to Beirut in 1979. And um, I lived inside a civil war uh, in Lebanon for, for almost five years. And what I saw was what happens, I, I saw a community break down. I saw what happens when people go all the way. When people assume that they can just go all the way, uh, push systems to their limits and they won't break. But actually they will break um, when you go beyond certain norms, when you stress systems completely, when you um, refuse to acknowledge changes in your society and accommodate them. And, um, one of the most searing memories I have from Beirut, Ron, is that one day, I don't remember, it was Shiites fighting Sunnis or Palestinians fighting, you know, uh, Lebanese, I, I can't remember. But I was on Hamra Street, which is the, the main street in, in Beirut, or just off Hamra Street, and fighting was sort of encroaching, and I saw a car driving backwards at 50 miles an hour. And it sort of stayed in my head as the image of what happens when things really break down. You, know, you, you see people driving, swerving madly to avoid fighting going 50 miles an hour backwards. And so what I worried about about this moment, the reason I raised the specter of civil war is not only because Lord knows we have so many guns in, around in this society, but, but people, are, are, people are pushing the system to its limits and beyond. People are going to extremes. They're, they're doing things that they know violate norms. One of the things I've learned from the whole Trump experience is that the words on paper of our constitution, they're hugely important. But it's actually the norms that we bring to those words that matter most. Um, you know, not giving Barack Obama his Supreme Court choice, even a hearing, even a vote, um, uh, 
uh, because he was in the last year of his administration and then ramming through um, uh, a Supreme Court choice on just the exact situation only when people are already starting to vote. Everyone knows that that's what we call to the playground. That's cheating. That, that's cheating. That we, that, that you're, that's not right. And when, when people push things to extremes like that, um, something can break. You know, I, I have the honor of being a, a Wednesday columnist for the New York Times for almost my whole 25, almost 26 years now as a columnist. What that means is I get the first column after every election because I write <laughs> Tuesday night for Wednesday. So it's like it, some years it's great. I got to write about Obama. Uh, um, some years it's really harrowing. Like the last election, I had to write three columns um, in the space of about three hours. First column was slightly tilted toward Hillary, the second one neutral, and the third one that Trump won. So there were three columns that night, um, almost four years ago now to the day. But they all ended with, or they all began, I can't remember now, with the same quote. It was a quote from a very close friend of mine, Leslie Goldwasser, who's an immigrant um, uh, from Zimbabwe. And Leslie came here over 30 years ago from a little Jewish community uh, called Bulawayo in Zimbabwe. Very successful um, uh, investment banker. Uh, but Leslie had said to me one day, you know, Tom, um, you Americans kick around your country like it's a football, but it's not a football. It's a Fabergé egg. You can drop it and you can break it. Be careful. And I ended each one of those three columns with the same quote. And I feel it even more so today. So as we turn to these elections, um, I have to ask whether you think uh, as these systems are under stress, does the COVID pandemic play the most central role in evidence of these systems breakdown in terms from the federal government, in terms of the connections between the federal government and the state governments, or are there other salient issues that really divide or separate these two candidates as we look at this particular election? Well, you know, COVID obviously is hugely important. Maybe I'll just say a few words about how I thought about it since the very beginning. You know, the book that uh, I wrote a book back in 2008, which some ways my favorite book. It's called Hot, Flat, and Crowded. Um, it's about the environment. It's about natural systems. And the book came out um, in uh, September of 2008. And um, it, was, it was number one on the New York Times bestseller list for three weeks. And then there was this bank called the Lehman Brothers that went under. My <laughs> book with it. <laughs> and, um, uh, but that book, because uh, it was about, it was about the natural world, basically. It was about the world getting hot, climate change, flat, more globalization, rising middle classes, and crowded more people, and how the, the convergence of hot, flat, and crowded was really shaping, uh, you know, reshaping the world. So um, uh, in doing that book, I really got immersed in natural systems and, and got exposed to a lot of thinkers, the Ed Wilsons of the world, you know, who think about the world through natural systems. So when, when, um, when this started, um, it was actually those people who I really fell back on again because this was a natural systems event. You know, my daughter, Natalie, my, my youngest daughter is the executive producer of All Things Considered, a weekend on national public radio. Um, and I'm so proud of her. She's a great little journalist. And so Anne and I don't miss a show. And on Easter Sunday, they did a roundup of um, pastor's sermons uh, at the height of the pandemic, this was, you know, last April, um, uh, uh, about, you know, COVID on Easter Sunday. And my favorite, was uh, Pastor um, uh, Michael Curry at National Cathedral. And he actually, um, he actually ended his sermon by, um, excuse me, Sorry. he actually ended his sermon by um, singing a little song. Uh, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. Now, if you just substitute she, Mother Nature, for he, you'll understand where we are. She got the whole world in her hands. We haven't been here before, unless you were alive in 1918. This is the first time for our generation of plants and animals that we have all experienced one of Mother Nature's uh, fastballs all at the same time. Uh, now, Mother Nature throws these fastballs at her plants and animals um, uh, to sort out who, who, will, who is the fittest, who shall get their DNA into the next generation. Um, 
And uh, these fastballs are germs and, and they're viruses. Well, viruses actually are just other living, they're also living things just looking for a warm niche, you know. Um, but uh, it, when they come into our bodies, they're like fastballs. They're like germs, they're viruses, they're, they're um, uh, storms, they're tornadoes, they're hurricanes, they're droughts, they're wildfires. These are all things that mother nature throws at her plant and animal species to sort out who, who is the fittest. And, and when she throws these fastballs, um, who does she reward? Now, she doesn't reward the smartest. She doesn't reward the strongest, no. She actually rewards the most adaptive. Which of her species is the most adaptive in the face of these Darwinian challenges? And um, when, she, when she tries to determine that, I'm obviously anthropomorphizing her, but you, you know what I see. She basically asks her plant and animal species three questions um, uh, about their adaptation strategy. The first is, do you respect my fastball? Do you respect my virus? Because if you don't, it will kill you or someone you love, number one. Second, she asks, are you coordinated in your response to my virus? Because I evolved my virus over millennia to find any crack in your immune system, either your individual immune system or your collective immune system. Are you coordinated? And third, she asks, um, have you built your adaptation strategy on chemistry, biology, and physics? Because that's all I am, says Mother Nature. I'm just chemistry, biology, and physics. You can't talk me up. You can't talk me down. You can't say Mother Nature. You know, we're having a, a bad fall. Could you take the fall off? Now, she's going to do whatever chemistry, biology, and physics dictate. And she always bats last. And she always bats a thousand. Do not mess with Mother Nature. So um, the problem with Trump is that Donald Trump has no familiarity with natural systems. He looks at the world through markets, not mother nature. His only exposure to natural systems is building golf courses where he built waterfalls. He famously built waterfalls in his Palm Beach course. So he actually thought he could dominate nature. And you may remember in the first week of the crisis when the stock market um, uh, collapsed by like 2000 points one day, and then he gave a speech, did some things and it went up another 2000 points that day. He actually took a screenshot of the market graph going up and he emailed it, uh, turned it into a, a chart and sent it to Lou Dobbs on Fox Business News. And that knucklehead showed it that night on Fox Business News. It was a graph of the market going up, signed Donald J. Trump, as if he did that. Well, while Trump was doing that, I believe it was March 13th, I don't remember the exact date, it was right around then. While he did that, Mother Nature was invisibly, silently, inexorably and exponentially and mercilessly spreading COVID-19. So there was a complete mismatch here. Trump thought if the market was going up, he was winning against mother nature. But of course, mother nature is not paying attention to that at all. So he has no idea of natural systems and how inexorable they are. So if you look around the world, Ron, just to close this point, you'll see kind of three broad strategies that have been out there. The first is the China strategy. So China basically said, we're gonna take our surveillance system, every camera we have, every eavesdropping system, every AI, you know, a facial recognition system that we use to control our people. And we're gonna use, we're gonna repurpose those to control a virus and people carrying the virus. And um, uh, it's been very effective. If you can do that, um, they have, they have 4,700 deaths so far, they, they say. Double it, triple it, quadruple it, however, whatever. It's a fraction of what we have, okay? Especially relative to their population. And they said, we're gonna control the virus using a surveillance system. And um, until we have herd immunity, until we get a vaccine to get um, herd immunity that way. Then there were democratic variants of the China strategy, Singapore, um, Hong Kong, South Korea, Taiwan, these Confucian societies that are very order bound, um, uh, top down and respectful of rules basically. Um, and, uh, and these democratic societies have done quite well uh, in their way. Then there's the um, Swedish model. Sweden said, we're actually gonna expose our people to the virus and try to develop herd immunity naturally um, and keep the economy open. And then there's the Trump strategy, which was to claim we were going to be as effective as China, actually act like we're going to be Sweden, prepare for neither, and boast that you're superior to both. 
That was our strategy. So we locked down recklessly and um, inconsistently, and then we opened up recklessly and inconsistency, in inconsistently. And now Mother Nature is just doing her thing and having her way. So well, how do you see this playing out through the election? Do you see the, the 170 million Americans and whoever will vote actually understand this or uh, wanna understand this and consider this when they're voting in the election or is COVID behind the economics or the finance or what they believe Trump to be the better candidate when it comes to the future economy of the country? What, how do you think this fits into the election results? You know, like everything, um, if you like Trump, then you think it, none of it's his fault. Um, and if you uh, don't like him, you think it's all his fault. Um, and, you know, the truth is somewhere in between. Um, any government would have had a hard time doing this because we have a very, we have a very federal system with a lot of authority for states and mayors. We have a very individualistic, libertarian streak in our society. Um, uh, we are not a Confucian society, and um, uh, we are not a particularly, you know, order um, uh, respectful of hierarchy. And we're, we're, our America is just terrible for a pandemic. But Trump, I would argue, his leadership made it 100% worse. Because what, what's always frustrated me about Trump, uh, history, I, I say, will not damn him for um, uh, what, what he didn't do early, when it was hard and confusing. It's what he's not doing now. When, when the right thing is obvious and actually relatively easy, wear a mask, practice social distancing, wash your hands. Just ask every American when they go out to wear a mask. It, it's not, this has nothing to do with personal freedom. This actually has to do, I wear a mask to, to protect my neighbor, to protect my coworker, to protect the person I'm in a bus with, to protect my fellow citizen. That's why I wear a mask. Uh, in case I'm carrying this thing. It's about the most patriotic thing you can do. And a different president who rephrased it around that, I think really could have summoned our better angels. Trump made it mask or Brandeis opening when it should be mask for Brandeis opening. The more people wear masks, the more Brandeis, the, the Brandeis and other universities can open. The more you wear a mask, the better chance you can have people in your restaurant. You know what I mean? Uh, he, 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 he made them, because that's his whole nature. Everything for him is for and against, you know. And so instead of making mask for schools, he made it mask or schools. And that I think really set us back. So I wanna to turn to the media uh, simply because so much about this election has been played out in the media. A lot of criticisms about media coverage. And this question I have really relates to your paper, the New York Times. So you've been at the New York Times on the op-ed page for a long time, as you mentioned, almost all of your 25 years. And this summer, an opinion writer, Barry Weiss, Barry Weiss, resigned over claims of bullying, harassment, and, and a stifling groupthink that was limiting free expression and the engagement of perspectives in the opinion section of the Times. This came on the heels of the forced resignation of James Bennett, who was editor of the editorial section of the newspaper, over what A.G. Sulzberger, the Times publisher, attributed to, quote, a significant breakdown in our editing processes, unquote, after Bennett approved the publishing of an opinion piece by Senator Tom Cotton. What light can you shed on the picture Weiss paints that there is a certain groupthink in ideology at the venerable New York Times that filters out dissenting opinions and at least in the Weiss case leads to bullying and harassment. And what impact will this have on the Times own credo of providing all the news that's fit to print? And I mentioned this because I know many who believe this has had an impact on covering the election and controversial topics in an unbiased way, and have therefore abandoned their longtime daily reading of the paper. What are your thoughts on this? Not going there. Um, you know, uh, you know, I've worked at the New York Times for 40 years, Ron. It's, it's, it's actually part of my name. I'm Tom Friedman from the New York Times. And um, whatever criticism I have of the paper, I, uh, I do it privately uh, inside the paper. Um, with my bosses. I can only speak for myself. Um, uh, and I can tell you, I write whatever I want. <laughs> and um, uh, nobody tells me not to. Uh, I supported Trump on China. I supported Trump on, um, uh, on the uh, uh, UAE Israel deal. Um, uh, President gave several speeches saying, 
Tom Friedman from the New York Times supported me, said, I can't believe the New York Times let him do that. So um, I, I write what I want. Uh, I thought Barry Weiss made an important contribution to the paper through her voice. I'm very sorry she left. Okay. Okay, all right. Let me move on to a topic that I know is of great interest to Brandesians and to all of our, our, our viewers. And that has to do with the Middle East and Israel. And of course, your time there, your first post was in Beirut. The book was terrific, uh, that book on Beirut to Jerusalem. Uh, and over the past year, we've seen several diplomatic developments in Israel, not the least of which has been the normalization of Israeli Emirates, Israeli Bahrainian, and to some extent, Israeli Sudanese relations. What are your thoughts about the impact of these developments on the future of the Middle East? How does this fit into the larger picture for the US and for the Middle East? Well, I really thought this was important, and I think it will be seen in time as, as important. Um, it, it was important both for what it accomplished, Ron, and for what it, it exposed, okay? So let's, let's talk about both. Uh, on the accomplishment level, um, we now have probably the most successful Arab state, uh, the UAE. If you just look at sort of governance and what it's built around Dubai and credible international entrepot, you know, um, and because uh, yeah, people have been to Dubai or not, and obviously it's, it's glitz and it's real estate and all those things, but, but also it's quite an amazing entrepot. And um, it didn't happen in Kuwait City, didn't happen in Doha, didn't happen in Bahrain, didn't happen in Jeddah. So the fact that that happened in Dubai was not like a natural thing. That, that, that really took a lot of effort and leadership and vision. And so, so you got the most successful Arab state now partnering with the most successful non-Arab state. Um, uh, and they will partner on military intelligence matters vis-a-vis -vis Iran. They will partner on agriculture, I think investment, science, technology, and health. The more the Middle East starts to look like the European Union, you know, where people actually trade and mix and travel, and the less it looks like the Syrian civil war, that's a good thing. That's just a good thing. Number so one. You envision you envision developments coming from these. This is just the first few steps of a larger process that you see happening. Exactly, and, and I think it's really good and healthy. At the Jewish Muslim level, you know, I think it's really important that maybe it's the beginning of you know Jewish Muslim relations. If you look from the span of history, you know, if every Jew had lived in the Middle East and not in Europe for the last, you know, since the diaspora, um, well, there'd be six million more Jews alive in the world today. Now, Jews under Muslim rule have had ups and downs, but for the but but there was no Holocaust, okay? And Jews have, uh, at times had very thriving Babylonian Talmud kind of experiences you know, in the Muslim world, basically, that was before then. But anyways, um, uh, but the point is that, you know, if you talk to, um, uh, if you go to Israel and talk to Jews who grew up in Egypt or Iraq or um, uh, Yemen or Morocco, Tunisia, Libya, um, you know, many of them um, have rather warm feelings to these countries they left. It was only as a result of the, uh, uh, the creation state of Israel um, uh, that, that this all, Kind of got off the rails, and Muslim Jewish relations, and so what? I, my, what are my hopes from this? Is that it's the beginning of actually repairing what is not a natural thing—the rift between Muslims and Jews. Um, I don't want to exaggerate this. This is one country, you know what I mean? But it it can be the beginning of that. Um, the UAE is building this whole complex with, I think it's be the world's biggest synagogue, church, and mosque all in one complex that they're building there. Um, and so I don't want to invest too much in it. I just say, but it, it can be a beginning of, of that. I think that's a, also a healthy thing. Um, it also has taken the veto away from Palestinians. Um, uh, you know, the Palestinians um, basically got, I think, intellectually lazy. Um, they just assumed that they could say no and everyone would follow suit, no, no matter what they no matter what they did, whether they're saying no to Ehud Barak or Yitzhak Rabin or Ehud Olmert. And, and finally, the region, their, their, um, uh, their Arab you know, colleagues just got sick of it. Um, they, they really saw people who just were not trying hard, that they'd been overindulged by the world. Um, and they just thought they could just keep saying no and not have to compromise. And so I think in time, this could have a good, possibly a positive effect on Palestinians. All of those. Oh, go on. All of those are on the sort of positive side of the ledger. And the fact that Saudi Arabia has allowed overflights now between Israel and Dubai, 
clearly shows that they want to go in that direction as well. But now we have to get inside the mechanics of this deal, because the deal not only opened something, you know, people, a lot of people who wrote about it, I noticed were very critical. They say, well, the UA just did this to get F-35s, to which I said, no. You mean they had, they had other interests other than peace with the Jews? Hello? You know, the way you get big change in the Middle East is when the big players do the right things for the wrong reasons. If you <laughs> want to do the right thing for the right reasons, you wait forever. You think Anwar Sadat came to Jerusalem because he liked Golda Meir's eyes? You know, I mean, he was looking to break away from the Soviet Union to get access to American military and financial aid. It always starts with hardcore interests, but then it can grow into things or not. But, but you know, the idea that it, 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 it wasn't a, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, some kind of kumbaya session where everyone, you know, realized, you know, that they'd, they'd gone astray. That doesn't bother me at all. But now we have to go inside the mechanics of the deal just to understand this, because it, not, it also revealed something very important. So Kushner's whole strategy was, um, this was the most pro-Israeli plan ever. You know, Bibi Netanyahu over many years would say to American diplomats, this was a common refrain, just test me, test me, test me. You test me, I will, I'll surprise you. So what Kushner did, because he just happened to be very pro-Israel, God bless him, I, I'm, I'm happy with that. He basically let Netanyahu, he didn't just test him. He gave him and, and Dermer, the, his ambassador in Washington, the pen, said, you write the plan. You write down everything you would need to politically get this plan through. So they settled on, well, we'll be able to annex every Israeli settlement, basically, or 30, you know, 30 percent of the West Bank and the Jordan Valley. And um, and the Palestinians, we get 70 percent, very disconnected. And they could have an, a, a, something they call their capital uh, outside of Jerusalem, on the edge of Jerusalem. Just like uh, Bibi's ultimate dream. What happened? Um, uh, Bibi actually said, I'm going to take my 30 percent and next that right now. And um, but I'm not going to recognize the Palestinians' right to a state on the other 70%, because my settler base won't let that happen. So the whole reason the UAE deal happened was because Trump and Kushner said, no, no, you can't do that. If you want your 30% annexed, you have to recognize the right of Palestinians to get their state on the 70%. And Netanyahu went back to the settlers and they said, no way. We will not recognize a Palestinian state under any conditions under any size in the West Bank. So what this plan revealed was that Bibi could not accept Bibi's own plan. Um, that's a very important thing for the Jewish people to think about because had annexation happened, okay, had Israel annexed the West Bank um, and not in any way recognized you know, uh, even the right of Palestinians to a state surrounded by an Israeli army in 70% of the West Bank, that would have blown up every Jewish institution in the world, including Brandeis University. Which side are you on? Do you agree with that? Do you not agree with that? <laughs> so, um, this was a very explosive, you know, bomb that got diffused because the UAE stepped in and said, we've got an idea. We've always wanted, we've been wanting to open relations with you. So I tell you what, Bibi, you give up annexation, we will give you full diplomatic relations and normalization. So that's how it all happened. But we have to remember the Palestinians are still there. They aren't going anywhere. And maybe more dangerously, I'm probably losing you donors right and left here, Ron, but maybe more dangerously, okay, um, they, uh, this is going to become an internal issue. Like what Secretary of State, now that Bibi could not accept Bibi's own plan, what Secretary of State is going to run out to the Middle East and say, I've got a plan, you know? So what's going to happen is the Palestinian issue is going to recede into Israel and become an internal Israeli issue about civil rights. I can't think of anything more dangerous for my Jewish state than that. So Tom, suppose we have a Biden administration. Do you believe that this track that we're on, this positive movements that you just described, and 
leave behind the second part of your answer to answer this question, then you can turn to that as well. Whether a Biden administration and the brain trust that he would bring into his administration in the foreign policy sphere would have any change of course. Do you envision a drastic change in US foreign policy there in the evolution of the relationship between Israel and other Arab states? What do you see in that front? It's a good question, Ron. I, I don't really know. I know the people who are advising Biden, you know, and, and, and um, Jake Sullivan and Tony Blinken and Tom Donald. These, these are good guys. Um, and gals, the, the, um, uh, Michelle Floor and I will probably be Secretary of Defense. Um, uh, I think they're, it, will this return to, you know, I think a more standard American foreign policy. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, I think relations between Netanyahu and, and Biden administration would be complicated because um, Netanyahu really went, you know, full force for Trump um, uh, and is really bet more on, frankly, American evangelical Christians than on American Jews uh, who he thinks are a lost cause. Uh, so that'll be interesting to follow. I, I don't know. I, I think the biggest issue, Ron, as far as Israel is concerned, is how will they approach um, Iran? And, um, and here, I think Trump has left Biden, on two fronts, Trump has left Biden a lot of leverage if Biden wins, uh, China and Iran. Um, uh, you know, my view on China was that, my view is that Donald Trump is not the American president that Americans deserve, but he is the American president that China deserves. Um, uh, and he, 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 someone needed to call the game and, and he did it um, the way he did it I'm, I'm very critical of because it's complicated. I won't get into that here, but he did. I supported the Iran deal under President Obama. I thought it was worth a try. Let's see if we can limit their, we can block their nuclear development program for 15 years, see if it opens up. Um, and basically I'm, I'm quite comfortable um, with Trump breaking the deal now, because uh, I think the test happened and they failed it. Um, and, uh, and so, so, but again, with Trump, it, it, he, he's, he's really good at breaking things but he wasn't good at then building a global coalition to try to structure a new deal. So Iran now is building their nuclear bomb again. So, so we need it. So Biden's going to come in and that's going to be right in front of him. So I think there is a real chance now because Trump will leave behind a lot of leverage with Iran, these sanctions, which are really hurting Iran. So Biden with creative diplomacy, I think could actually come up with a, with, with a better deal that come to the Iranians and say, instead of a 15 year limit, on your nuclear development program, yeah, we're ready to lift the sanctions for permanent limits. You know, no more sunset on this. And uh, so I think there's a potential there for some creative diplomacy. So I have one more foreign, I have a lot of questions that I uh, want to ask, but I'm going to ask one more foreign policy question before I turn it over to uh, questions from the audience that we're taking down here. And that has to do with uh, Russia and China. So you started to touch on China a little bit, and most recently, uh, you know, President Trump warned that if Joseph Biden was president, uh, China would eat our lunch. That was his quote, I think, in the debate. Uh, so I want to ask you about what you see as, as uh, whether or not that's the case, if we should fear uh, a Biden presidency and China going back to eating our lunch, number one. And number two, just a little overview from your perspective of what this relationship with Vladimir Putin is. Like, what, how can we explain this? I mean, everyone makes jokes about, you know, what is, what is, what is, um, Putin have on Trump, et cetera, et cetera. But these two areas are important. So take China, take Russia. So in China, um, as I said, you know, I think that we needed someone to call the game. Um, and, uh, and Trump did that. But again, I thought the way he did it um, uh, was so suboptimal. So what, so what do I mean? Um, though I think the effective way to move China, um, you know, you cannot move China's one, I actually prefer it not to actually use the word China. I much prefer one sixth of humanity. Okay, that gives you a size of the scale. You know, people say China, there's China, and there's Gabon. You know, no, no, th this is one sixth of humanity. So how you move one sixth of humanity um, takes a lot of leverage. And I thought the way to deal with China was to sign the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership deal, get um, the 12 biggest Pacific economies on our side around US design trade rules, 40% of global GDP, then go to the Europeans, and get them on our side. Um, and then you have about 80% of global GDP and then sit down with the Chinese and say, what we wanna to talk to you about is what are the right and fair universal global rules for trade, okay? It's the world against China. Now, when you do that, 
you trigger all these reformers inside China on your side. What Trump made it was me versus Xi over who's got the biggest tariff. And when you do that, you trigger all the Chinese nationalists on the Xi's side. And that's why we, we got a trade war. Would anyone in your audience please raise your hand? Tell me if you got some benefit from this trade war. I mean, maybe there's some soybean farmers out there who did, but after, that was after they got crushed for two years. You know, so it, we re, it was totally suboptimal because Trump never wants to do anything multilaterally, never wants to do anything with allies. And yes, it can be slower, it can be more cumbersome, but at the end of the day, you could get something sustainable. You know, with Putin, I, you know, I have no idea. I, I never was into the, if you read my column, into the collusion thing. I thought Trump was never organized enough to collude with anybody. Um, and I never saw evidence of, you know, uh, that whole steel thing and, you know, memo. And uh, I just didn't get it. I never, I never saw any real evidence of that. But what I see is, is a president behaving toward the leader of uh, Russia, um, who does not mean us well, behaving in ways where he is taking his word over the word of U.S. intelligence agencies, where he's clearly coddling him in the world, where the Russian president just poisoned the leading you know, uh, opposition figure in, in Russia. And, and, and Trump really has nothing to say about it. So I don't know what's there, Ron. Mm -hmm. um, if it's just a fascination with dictators, powerful people, um, if it's something more that Putin has some goods on him, I, I have no idea. All I know is that's not normal. We've never seen that in any American president. No, no, nor a lot of other things. Okay, let me now turn to the questions from our viewers, and there are many, so let me just get through them. All right, so I'm reading right from the questions. Tom, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Would you reflect on Brandeis's motto, truth even unto its innermost parts? How can we preserve our democracy when truth is optional and we have alternative facts? How can we fix the system if Biden is elected? How can we fix the system if Trump is elected? That's a good question. Such a really important question. Um, so let's go back to the basis of the question, Brandeis's motto, truth unto its innermost parts, a really appropriate motto, because basically democracies are built on two pillars, truth and trust. Unless we have basic shared truths, we have no idea what path to go down. And unless we trust each other, we have no ability to go down that path very far, because you can only do big, hard things together. And to me, the great damage of the last four years is that we've had a president. Again, I'm, you all read my column, you know what I think. We've had a president without shame, backed by a party without spine, amplified by a network without integrity. We've never found, we've never been up against that trifecta before. A president utterly without shame, a party utterly without spine, and a network, Fox, utterly without integrity that's turned itself into Pravda of the White House. And when you have that, you have an engine for destroying truth and trust, you know? Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I have my issues with the left too. I'm a pretty centrist kind of guy. I'm, I'm not actually the left's favorite columnist either. So, um, uh, but that's another, my issues with them are nothing to do with these core principles, okay? Um, and you cannot sustain a democracy um, uh, without that. So you may have noticed if you've been reading the Times for the last 24 hours, they've actually asked all the columnists to do essays on what, what's actually been lost the last four years. Um, and if you go to the, our online, you'll see them. They're all going to be in Sunday's Week in Review, but, but I, I, I did my mind's going to go up tomorrow. And to me, um, we can get by, Ron, um, with four years of these attacks on truth and trust. I would say it hasn't reached the bone and lymph nodes of our society. The cancer has not metastasized there, but four more years and something here will be really broken. It will be into the bone and lymph nodes of this society. And then I don't, I don't know how to get it out. And you're confident that a Biden presidency should that happen could reverse what we're talking about here, that again, the people around him and knowing what you know about Joseph Biden and the people who are in his brain trust uh, could help reverse this as the questioner asked. Ron, I'm not confident about anything. 
but I know I don't know if Biden will be sufficient. I know his winning will be necessary. Mm -hmm. He said to me, Tom, I'm the genie of Brandeis. I'm the Brandeis genie, and I grant you one wish for this election. What would it be? And I'd say, oh, genie Ron, my wish would be that Texas goes for Biden. Mm -hmm. Why do I say that? Because if Texas goes for Biden, that will blow up the Republican Party, and it will force it to come to terms with the fact that this whole Trump adventure they went down was a complete uh, party destroying uh, adventure. And then I believe the party will split between the never Trumpers, the Lincoln Project, the moderate Republicans, um, and the sort of conspiracy buffs basically. And um, I, I am very hoping, I, I, I can tell you the column if Biden wins, uh, that I'll be writing on, on Wednesday morning, next, next Wednesday morning. It'll be urging him to form a national unity government. I, I, I would love to see a Mitt Romney as Secretary of Commerce. Mm -hmm. I would love to see other moderate Republicans, um, not, not all, but a few symbolically in the cabinet. I think we need to reward and bring together under one tent the moderate Republican uh, uh, coalition. It's still small, but we'll see how big it is or not. Um, uh, with the center uh, and left of the Democratic Party. And I've done several of these, you know, where I, I said, you know, I'd love to see AOC be UN ambassador and I'd love to see Mitt Romney be Secretary of Commerce. Yeah, I mean, I think national <laughs> unity government. You know, it, I, I haven't been able to travel anywhere, Ron. But if I could, if you said, Jeannie Ron, it gives me one more wish, I would actually go to South Carolina and I'd go to a black church and I'd like to sit down with the, with the, with the ladies in the choir and ask them one question. You know, when the South Carolina primary happened and Joe Biden came through here, he was, he was almost finished. Yep. He was basically finished. The referee was counting him out. One, two, three. And it's basically the black community of South Carolina led by Jim Clyburn yep. stopped the count and said, Joe, get up off the mat. And they slapped him around a little bit, poured some water on him, got him back into the, got him back into the fight. And he went from there to win the, just like that, to win the Democratic nomination. And I'd love to ask them, why did you do that? What were you thinking? Because you wanted Kamala Harris to be vice president? I don't think so. You could have voted for her. Because you wanted a black president, you could have voted for Cory Booker. I think there was tremendous wisdom coming from South Carolina. And it's because they intuited that what the country actually needed most right now was a healer, someone who could pull us together and prevent another civil war, someone who could stop the country from being torn apart. And they intuited that the guy who could do it was this 77 year old guy from Delaware. Um, and I think that's why they lifted him up and put him back in the fight. And they may have saved the country um, and so that's, that's just my intuition, but I'd, and, I'd, I'd love to go down there and ask him. You're there, I'll ask you to ask them about their senatorial race too, but that's another whole other issue. Um, so this is not a crystal ball question, but uh, it's not a genie question, but a crystal ball question. And I have to ask you that came through multiple times here about from your experience and knowledge and what you see, what do you think, when do you think the election results will be final? Uh, and what are the chances you think right now Biden has to win? So sitting here today, if you ask me what the odds are, and that's why I'm making no predict, I can just tell you the odds. I think there's a 40% there's a chance that Biden wins in a landslide. I think there's a 30% chance that Biden squeaks it out. Mm -hmm. I think there's a 30% chance that Trump wins. That's how I would, that's how I'd game it right now. Um, so I... I, I, um, I have the Times permission. Every other election, I had to write a column, holding column for Thursday, for Tuesday night, and then update it, you know, through the night. And this time, they just said, "Tom, take it easy. You don't have to write till Wednesday morning." So I, I'm just going to wait. I will be very surprised again if there's that landslide. We'll know it, you know, by Wednesday morning. Um, I'm hoping that happens, but um, 
you know, there's, there's, there's one paragraph I really hope I can write. I may not happen. I'll tell you the paragraph I really want to write. I want to say that if I ever run into Bill Barr or Pompeo or Lindsey Graham on the street after Biden wins, I will not raise my voice. I certainly will not raise my fist, but I will indulge myself to say four words to them. Three words, excuse me. Shame on you. Shame on you for what you put this country through and for putting your politics ahead of your country for this man. I just really want to be able to write that graph. Okay. Uh, I want to turn before we leave, uh, we, have, um, we have probably time for one more question before I want to turn to Brandeis uh, for a moment. But this particular question has come up several times. You've alluded to it piecemeal. Uh, throughout your um, uh, discussion here. And the questions, several of them ask, if you were to advise the next president on our three biggest foreign policy priorities, what are they and what would you advise? Three foreign priorities. You touched on some of these already, but what are the three most important in your view as we go forward from this era? Well, you know, the most important global issue is climate change, clearly, and building a global consensus around climate change. I think the way you do that, actually, this is what my book, Hot, Flat, and Crowd, was all about. The way you actually do that is by America leading by example. I'm, I'm a big believer on that emulation is much more powerful uh, than, you know, um, uh, you know, giving people orders that when people see something that they want to emulate, that, that's just hugely powerful. And America saying, we are going to, I would reform, you know, I mean, if I had been able to advise Biden, I would have said, look, you know, I think that the, the space race of the 21st century is the Earth race. I don't want to put a man on the moon. I want to lead the world in designing the cleanest, greenest, energy efficient technologies so more men and women can stay here on Earth. That I think it's the Earth race that America should be leading, um, needs to be leading. And I think by leading it is, that's what my book was all about. That's how we get our mojo back. That's how we get back excited about science, excited about innovation, excited about technology. And we also get our moral leadership back, that the world sees us taking the lead on this issue. So that would be certainly number one. Number two is, is we have to find a way to um, uh, work together with China uh, mm -hmm. but without um, sacrificing our, our values, uh, let alone our interests. And um, it's building bridges where possible, drawing red lines where necessary. And um, that's going to take a really um, uh, complicated approach because, uh, and a subtle one, uh, which I think Biden will have people around him who can do, but it, it's going to be a huge challenge. Um, because this pandemic could be remembered, Ron, if we don't get this right, as the moment when China passes us on the left. <laughs> you know, um, my friends at Infosys, the Indian high tech company, um, uh, they had a saying back in the early 2000s, you win in the turns, you win in the turns. That is, it's the big technology turns, the history turns, that it's when you pass people in the turn, that's when you win. And I have a real fear that if we, four more years of Trump, and I think you'll see China uh, passing us, passing us by. We, we have a, there's a huge structural problem. I'll just say this very quickly. So, you know, for the, the epic 1979 to 2019, that was an epic in US-China relations. It was the epic of what I call unconscious integration. So that Brandeis could say, we want to send students to China. Uh, we want to admit Chinese students, no problem. A company in China could send employees to Boston and Boston could have a supply chain to China. And everyone could sort of do all of this. We all did it. And, and we just kind of became one country, two systems. American China, not Hong Kong and China. And it was unconscious, you know, we, we, we really coupled. And that has broken down uh, for a number of reasons. Um, one is that um, uh, China has changed. It's taken a real, China is so much more open today than it was 30 years ago and so much more closed today than it was five years ago. Um, I can tell you as a journalist, you know, um, in 1995 or 96, I actually monitored village elections in North, northeastern China. I mean, just amazing experience you could have. You can't, you couldn't even 
imagine doing that today. So China has become more closed. But the other, other issue is this, Ron. You know, um, uh, for 30 of those 40 years, China sold us what I call shallow goods. Sweaters we wore on our shoulders, socks we wore on our ankles, shoes we wore on our feet, solar panels we affixed to our roofs. And we sold China deep goods, software, ships, computer systems, stuff that went deep inside to their society. What's happened in the last five years, and this is what the Huawei story is all about, is China can now make deep goods too. And they want to sell them to us. But that's a real problem because they had to buy our deep goods. They didn't have a choice. We don't have to buy their deep goods. And we don't have a trust relationship to buy their deep goods. So when China was um, just selling us shallow goods, we didn't care whether they were authoritarian, libertarian, or vegetarian. When they want to sell us deep goods, stuff that's going to go inside the wiring of Brandeis University, we say, w w wait a minute, we don't have the shared values and trust relationship to buy your deep goods. So the meta story here is how do we collaborate you know, in the world, um, trade, when they want to sell us deep things, but we are the values difference really matters. You know, when, when Russia, with the Cold War, it didn't matter with Russia. Russia could make vodka, caviar, and Matryoshka dolls. That's all we ever bought from them. Who cared whether we trusted them or not? We didn't trust them. But with China, it's got a, you know, a much more of an economy that mirrors ours. And so I think the meta challenge for diplomacy is how do you build pathways of trust? You say to Huawei, we're going to let you wire the state of Massachusetts. We're going to watch you for five years. If we think things are on the up and up, we may let you do a whole Northeast or whatever. But we're going to have to build some kind of pathways. Otherwise, we're heading for a digital Berlin Wall. And there'll be a China technology universe, an American technology universe. And boys and girls, do not assume that the world will be with us. All right, I want to, before we close, we have six minutes, I see. I have two Brandeis-related questions. One came from a student. Uh, who asked, uh, what is your writing process? Because I write for the justice. So here's a student writer who writes for the campus newspaper asking you what your writing process is. So perhaps you can give a summary of how you go about writing your column. Wow, that's a great question. So, um, uh, well, I'll give you an example of my last column. Okay, um, and uh, I did a column uh, in Wednesday's paper. It was called, um, My President Saying Amazing Grace. Um, and it was about when Obama sang Amazing Grace um, uh, uh, after the, the killing in, in Charleston. So that column started out um, with me uh, about three days ahead of time uh, thinking, what is there left to say? This is my last regular column before the election. What is there left to say? And I thought, you know what I'm going to focus on? I'm going to focus on this thing that Trump tweeted about Obama that um, Trump retweeted a, a QAnon tweet that said that Obama had killed, had ordered the killing of SEAL Team Six that killed bin Laden. And then um, uh, 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 let bin Laden actually go away, it was a body double. I mean, this is so crazy. And, um, but it was precisely, you know, one of the things Trump has done is to define deviancy down so much that you have to stop sometimes and sit back and say, the president of the United States retweeted a tweet that said his predecessor murdered SEAL Team 6, that bin Laden was a body double, and that Iran and Pakistan delivered bin Laden to Pakistan so Obama could have a trophy kill. He tweeted both of those things. And I, I just said, you know, I'm going to do my column about that. That that, I, there's what, I, I, I don't want to talk about policy. Think about the norm breaking, the dishonesty, the um, defaming of the office of the presidency, that someone, someone would do that. So I was working on that column and out of the blue, you know, one good thing about being an old fart, I'm 67, so I have a lot of friends and contacts and people send me stuff. Uh, out of the blue, a friend of mine, uh, Elena Park, who runs Stanford Live, which is Stanford's auditorium, they're doing a lot of online events. She sent me this thing of the Kronos Quartet playing with the singer Mechlick. 
and her singing this amazing song. My president sang Amazing Grace um, uh, that was written about Obama's visit to that church in Charleston after the church killing, killing him nine people when he spontaneously sang Amazing Grace. And I, it came at night, um, uh, her email, and um, I go to bed kind of late and I called it up on my phone and I was in the dark of my room and listening to this rendition of this song. And it brought tears to my eyes. It was so powerful. And, um, and it just, it had the effect on me, which she wanted to have, which is, we once had a president who sang Amazing Grace in a black church after a white supremacist killed nine people. And suddenly I realized what my column was. To contrast Trump tweeting that Obama had ordered the killing of SEAL Team 6 with this song. And sometimes the combustion works. And it's been the most emailed item in the New York Times for two days. So uh, columns come from a lot of places, but that's where that one came from. It's just, uh, you know, unfortunately being a columnist is actually an act of chemistry. There's just stuff happens in my head. And if I knew how it happened, I would bottle it and sell it. And, you know, um, I give the proceeds to Brandeis, but I don't know how it happens. But being a columnist is all about making connections that other people might not make. So like a million people could have seen Trump's tweet or a million people could have seen that song, but hopefully you're the one who puts them together in a frame that is right for the moment, you know? Um, and uh, uh, that's what I do. If I knew how I did it, I, it's all chemistry. It's all crazy stuff that happens in my head. Okay, last question. And I'm sorry I didn't get to more Brandeis specific questions because we've got many. So you'll have to be quick on this one. But the question is people are interested in what you did beyond the classroom at Brandeis. What things, you know, extracurricular or things or activities that were important to you uh, in your time at Brandeis outside the classroom, in addition to learning to all you did uh, from your professors and in coursework? Well, I, um... You know, I had a lovely time at Brandeis and my, my friend Victor Friedman, who was a year ahead of me, um, not, not a relation. And I remember thinking of going to Friday night services and, and, and Victor used to call it Ahavat Brandeis, you know. Uh, and, uh, um, but to be honest, my dad died um, uh, in the summer before I came to Brandeis. And um, uh, that was a very wrenching experience for me, obviously. And um, so I was like super focused on my academics, um, spent a lot of time in the library. Um, the only real groups I was involved in, we had a Middle East peace group on campus mm -hmm. and we had a Middle East war group um, uh, that Professor Steve Rosen went on to work for APAC. We, we jokingly called them the Middle East peace group and the Middle East war group. Um, and so I did a certain amount of Middle East stuff. Uh, between my junior and senior year, I actually did a semester abroad at the American University in Cairo on the CASA program. Um, and um, I focused on, on my academics and, and I blessedly got a Marshall Scholarship to study in, in England. And, um, and I went to, to London and I really got my, I wrote for the justice, I maybe wrote one or two articles just because I was too focused on my academic. And I really got my start in journalism um, in London, um, uh, thanks to my now wife, then girlfriend. Um, so I did my Marshall, I did my first year at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, SOAS. And then I went up to Oxford and ultimately got my degree there. And in that year, I met my wife who was uh, from Des Moines, Iowa actually, um, and uh, was the ex-girlfriend of a friend of mine at Brandeis. And he told me all about it. And um, I did in London, uh, my good fortune. And she was going to the LSE, uh, she'd gone to Stanford. And we met in London and um, I was walking down the street in the, in the fall of 1975. And um, on the evening standard, you know, they have those blaring headlines, you know, Brad to Jen, we're finished, you know. And the, uh, at the time, Carter was running against um, Gerald Ford for president. Um, and uh, uh, the headline on the evening standard said, Carter to Jews, colon, if elected, I promise to fire Dr. K. And I stopped my then girlfriend, now wife, and said, look at that headline. Isn't that funny? Jimmy Carter is running for president and to win Jewish votes, he's promising to fire the first ever Jewish secretary of state. 
And I don't know what possessed me, Ron, but I went back to my dorm room and I wrote a column about it. I wrote a column about it. And um, my first real column. And my then girlfriend, now wife, um, uh, happened to be neighbors with Gilbert Cranberg, who was the editorial page editor of the Des Moines Register. Then a really um, you know, prominent, high quality Midwest paper. And she took my column home on Christmas vacation and gave it to Gil. And he liked it. And they printed it on a half page of the Des Moines Register with an Outh cartoon. And they paid me $50. And I thought that was the coolest thing in the whole world. I had been walking down the street. I had an idea. I wrote it up. And someone paid me $50. And it all comes back to Brandeis because your good friend introduced you to your then girlfriend, now wife, who then made this happen. So, Tom, we're very grateful. We're very proud of you. We're honored that you're an alumnus of Brandeis. And I want to thank you for this hour and hope that our uh, guests uh, it, it really enjoyed hearing from you. And um, thank you. I wish you the best. We look forward to reading your column the day after. Uh, we have some rest and, um, and good luck. Thank, uh, thank you, Tom. You. Thank you for your good work. Thanks for everybody's support. I'm honored to be an alum and uh, was really happy to do this. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone.